Hamas says 13 different groups have joined forces to launch more effective attacks, as they put it against the Israel. The group that you belong to has an impact on how you see yourself. Seven weeks ago, the Bosnian Serb forces advanced up this road towards Srebrenica. If somebody threatens the group, even if it doesn't threaten you personally, you will then feel that threat because you're part of that group. That group is part of yourself. This is a Catholic primary school and it is a school in the predominantly lawyers part of North Belfast. To understand group processes and group relations, social identity theory is immensely powerful. But even more than that, I think it's one of the few theoretical areas in psychology which has had an influence beyond psychology. How many children got to school today? 60 out of 230. People did take on social identity theory and they analysed everything from sectarianism in Northern Ireland to intergroup conflict in Malaysia to goodness knows what all over the world. And it has been and continues to be an incredibly influential approach. I looked actually in Google before talking to you and you know, it gets over two million hits. Miles Houston is one of many social psychologists whose work has been influenced by social identity theory. Henri Targefell first wrote about the theory with his colleague John Turner in a book published in 1979. But the first step was a set of experiments he ran in a boys' comprehensive school in Bristol in 1970 and 71. These experiments involved preferences for different abstract paintings and are known as the minimal group studies. They're now seen as classics in social psychology, but at the time the concept behind them was revolutionary. Rupert Brown is Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Sussex. Essentially he was concerned to discover the most primitive, the most elementary conditions that would be necessary for the arousal of some kind of prejudice, some kind of bias in favour of your group. Now up until the late 1960s there were I guess two dominant ways of thinking about prejudice and discrimination within psychology and many others within political science and sociology. The earliest was the idea that somehow prejudice is connected to the kind of person you are. And the other was the idea that prejudice and discrimination arose out of the ways groups related to each other. So that if groups were in conflict over land or power or some material resource, that would more or less determine them to be prejudicial towards the other. Tarshfeld wanted to see whether there was something more to the story. And so he said, well, let's see if we could create a situation in which people's personalities were not relevant, in which there was no actual real competition or conflict over anything, just the mere fact of being put in a group. I think it was one of a few really dramatic experimental results in social psychology on a par with the famous Milgram experiment where people just obeyed an authority to do something wrong. This was, I think, a classic experiment and I was very fortunate to have been involved in helping run it. Today, Michael Billig is Professor of Social Sciences at Loughborough University. But in 1967, when Henri Targefell was appointed Chair of Social Psychology at Bristol, Billig was in the third year of a psychology degree there. Fortunately, I was assigned to be in his tutorial group. By that time, I was a bit fed up with psychology. It hadn't really engaged my attention. But that all changed when he came. He was someone who was both personally very exciting as a lecturer and as a teacher and who was talking about the sorts of things I was interested in, which is about the psychology of politics and of prejudice and beliefs. And what was the work that you did with him? After I got my degree... He approached me to work with him over the summer, that summer, to design and run an experiment. He had this idea for an experiment to test whether if you just put people into groups and make the groups as meaningless as possible and people have no rationale for being in the group and they gain no benefit from being in the group, whether they still would show some sort of group identification and show some sort of loyalty to other people who were put in the same group. I didn't understand the theoretical background for the study, why it would become so important. It was just a job. So Targefell and his collaborators set to work to devise an experiment where members were assigned to groups almost at random, groups that should have no identity, no shared history and no cause for competition between them. 
This experiment began with 48 14 to 15 year old boys sitting in the language lab at their local school looking at 12 slides of abstract paintings. Half the paintings were by the artist Vasily Kandinsky, the other six were by Paul Clay. But the boys had no idea which were which. We shall show you them in pairs and we're interested to know which one of each pair you prefer. Rupert Brown took part in a recreation of the original experiment in 1975 for the BBC TV documentary The Human Conspiracy. Although the school students were shown pictures by Clay and Kandinsky and actually ticked that they liked the one on the left or the one on the right, they didn't know which ones were Clay pictures and which one were Kandinsky pictures. And in actual fact, when they were put into their groups, it was done completely at random. And then a few minutes later, they were asked, thank you for your help with that important decision-making study. Now we'd like to recompense you for taking part in our experiment, so would you help us to distribute this money? The general idea is that you will be awarding money to others. But you will not know who you'll be awarding money to, as everyone will be given code numbers. Now, the money you award is real money. OK, look, I've got a big bag of it here. And we're going to add it up and give it out at the end of the whole experiment. And you have to use these special little booklets, and you will be allowed to give money to people in the Clay group and people in the Kandinsky group. Never to yourself, only to other members of the Clay group or the Kandinsky group. And they wouldn't know who those people were, and they, so they couldn't give them to their friends no, or anything like they that? Had, they were just numbers. Uh, on a little book that said, person 53 in the Clay group, person 72 in the Kandinsky group. Now, every person will receive the amount of money uh, according to the points that he is awarded by the rest of the people here. They wouldn't know who else was in their group. They would only know their own group identity. And then they were asked to assign money, not to themselves, but to the others taking part in the experiment. And they would, wouldn't know who they were giving the money to, just whether they were in their group or another group. You are in the clay group. So if you take this booklet, go back to your seat and start working on the community. Okay? And that's Henri Tajfel himself, helping rerun his experiment for the BBC. You are under joy. You are in the Kandinsky book. Take this booklet. The booklet contained options for allocating points to their group and to the other group. The experimenters were looking to see whether they showed any sign of favouring their own group over the other. Friendships couldn't play a part. They were all randomly put into different groups, so their personalities couldn't play a part. Clay and Kandinsky couldn't be, there was no conflict between them, they were just random arbitrary groups. So, in theory, they shouldn't have shown any prejudice. And yet, quite reliably, Tarshville and his colleagues found that they always tended to give a bit more money to their own group. And so, having created an experimental situation where the groups were apparently meaningless, Tarshville's was a remarkable finding. Miles Houston is Professor of Social Psychology at Oxford University. Prior to Tajfel's work, there had been a firm view that competition was the source of intergroup bias. If people came into competition, whether it was on the rugby field or the football field or a war or industrial relations, it was competition that was driving the favouritism for your group over the other group. But Henri Tajfel did the crucial work with the minimal group paradigm, simply putting people on the most minimal of criteria into one group versus another group would bring about favouritism. No competition was necessary. This really was the first study to address what would be the base condition for group favouritism or group identity. And it provided the basis for much thinking, which Henri Tajfel did, about the conditions of group identity. And for him, the basic condition was categorization. What Henri Tajfel was showing is that the very act of telling people you're a member of this group, which means you're not a member of another group, had a psychological implication. Experiments of this kind show how easy it is to trigger off discrimination between groups, even when this discrimination has nothing to do with the interests of the individual who is doing the discriminating. But we have to take into account all the aspects of group membership, both the positive ones and the negative ones. The positive ones, of course, involve the individual's loyalty to his group, the importance and significance and value to him of his group membership, while the negative ones are all too well known in the form of wars, riots, racial and other forms of, pre of prejudice, etc. 
Henri Targefell speaking in 1975, and he was to die just seven years later. It was his own experiences as a Polish Jew during the war and in his work in the resettlement of refugees after the war that aroused his interest in prejudice and group identity. Michael Billick. The experiences of the Second World War clearly had shaped him both as a person and as an intellectual. As an intellectual, he often said that the reason he was an academic was to understand how genocide was possible. And all his work in psychology was aimed at that question. And how had he been personally affected during the war? Well, he didn't talk about the details, or certainly not to someone of my generation. He had left Poland for France to go to university in France. So he wasn't in Poland when the Nazis invaded. And it was because he was in France that he escaped the slaughter, which happened to the rest of his family and practically everyone he knew as a child. In France, he joined the French army and was captured as a prisoner of war. And he, he did tell me this. He said he was faced with a dilemma. Should he admit to the German army, which had captured him, that he was Jewish, or should he hide his Jewishness? And he knew his life depended on choosing correctly. And he chose to admit that he was Jewish on the grounds that they might find out later, and if they found out later, they would certainly kill him. And as it was, he wasn't killed. He was treated as a, a French prisoner of war and spent the rest of the war as a prisoner. And how did those experiences then influence his research? He worked for a while in relief agencies. He didn't become an academic straight away, and he often said that his work resettling those who had lost their homes or been in the concentration camps, he often said that work was the most important work which he did in the whole of his life. It was when he brought a group of Jewish children to England for holidays with Quaker families that Henri Targefell met his wife Anne, who'd fled Germany for England before the war. They married in 1948, and Henri studied psychology at Birkbeck College in London. I think initially he wasn't certain how he could use his studies in psychology to inquire into the big questions about prejudice and belief and genocide which he wanted to study, because in those days so much of psychology was about rats and was utterly trivial to someone of Tushfeld's intellect and background. One of the things that was very clear about Henri was, I mean, he was very concerned with issues of identity. His Jewish identity was very important to him. Steve Riker, Professor of Social Psychology at St Andrews University, was an undergraduate student of Tarchfell's at Bristol. I remember one party I was at, and I was in the same year as somebody else who now is a very senior social psychologist, Miles Houston, who's professor at Oxford, and, and Miles had got a first-class degree, and Henri really liked Miles, really valued Miles, but there was one thing missing. So he, he said to Miles, Miles, was your name always Hugh Stone? Hoping that it would have been Hugh Stein at some point. And I was told a story that he was hopeful that you might be Jewish and, and inquired whether <laughs> no. you actually called Miles Hugh Stein, not Hugh Stein. No, you Is that true? you've taken one of my stories. I know that that came to you directly from Steve Reich here in Scotland. And it, it is absolutely true. And social psychologists actually talk about this as a phenomenon now called in-group over-inclusion. This tendency to want to take in as members of your group people who do good things. And, of course, this is around the time when I'd floated to the top of that examining class and he really wanted wanted me to be a Hugh Stein and, and not a Houston. And it was very funny because his idea of doing it subtly was at a party at his house after a conference, he, he said to me in this, this very accented way he spoke, he said to him, Miles, would you like a whiskey? Come over in, into the corner. I didn't drink whiskey then and I don't drink it now, but this was on Retargeville, so I, I said yes. And we crept over into the corner and he took out these crystal glasses and promptly dropped one of them, thereby drawing attention to what we were doing and so on. But that was when he, he posed the question and I had to disappoint him. I think for him that Jewish identity was not a narrow identity. It wasn't about Jews, Israel or whatever. It, it was an identity which was deeply concerned with issues of oppression and deeply concerned with issues of inequality. He was 
heavily involved as the patron of the anti-Nazi League, for instance, in the late 70s. He was very supportive to Chilean refugees. So he was a man who was, who was committed. It was the minimal group studies which proved a turning point in Tajfel's career. They involved intricately designed charts or matrices for the boys to choose from when they allocated the money between their group and the other group. And remember, these groups were apparently based on nothing more than a preference for a painting. The genius of the studies, in many ways, lies in the matrices which constrain the behaviour in such a way that you can see the types of strategies that people use. It's not a matter of forcing them to differentiate, but it constrains the way in which they can differentiate. So, for example, one of the choices they might have would be to give 15 pence to their own group and, say, 10 pence to the other group. But another choice might be to give 11 pence to their own group, but only 1 pence to the other group. Very often they chose the latter because even though their group member got four pence less, the gap between 11 and 1 was bigger than the gap between 15 and 10. So it seemed that they were concerned to make a difference, to make their group seem a bit better than the other group. And that went against the idea that it was just material interest that was governing their behaviour. Even small differences can be very significant. As long as you are systematically doing better for your group, the first minimal group experiments were published in the 1970s. This was a time of great industrial relations unrest in this country, and he used to talk about the battles over wage differentials, where boiler makers used to hold out for one pound more than some other workers, because this was about differentials. This was about just having that bit more than the other group. Now, the studies have been criticised because you could argue that if you're taking part in this experiment, then to make sense of it, all you can do is to allocate the money based on which group you're in. What else is there to go on? Also, they were done with schoolboys, and it's hard to imagine a group of people more steeped in the importance of teams. But the studies have been replicated many times, and even when groups are created using nothing more than the toss of a coin, still we show this bias towards our own group. We seem unable to resist it. Now, there is a difference, of course, between showing favouritism towards one group and discriminating against another. Could these experiments distinguish between those two different things? No, they couldn't. And that was one of the other things that you could today call a limitation of the studies and something that has subsequently been improved upon. And it's generally now concluded that what those experiments do is they show the fairly minimal conditions for in-group favoritism but not for out-group derogation. One has to remember what was Sargeville trying to do. He wasn't trying to say I can toss a coin, I can get people to, to view abstract paintings and I can go off and explain the problems of Northern Ireland. He was asking a specific question in these studies, could social categorization on its own be responsible for the instigation of bias? Having decided that he thought it was, he then went on and he took huge steps forward in developing social identity theory. The important thing to realize is the minimal group experiments led to thoughts which led to the formulation of social identity theory by him and John Turner. But if you had social identity theory, you wouldn't then go and do the minimal group experiments. Social identity theory doesn't stand or fall on the minimal group paradigm. If somebody comes along tomorrow and says the minimal group paradigm is completely flawed for reasons that we didn't know before, fine, social identity theory will still stand. The key thing that came out of that minimal group study was simply the notion of being in a group. Because, and you have to remember the intellectual context in which the, that work was being done, very much dominated by North American social psychology, in which, as a social psychologist, you were really taught about the individual, the individual, how the individual thought about the world, perceived the world, responded to the world, and it was almost like that individual had no connection with anyone else, it was just an individual perceiver, an individual actor, and Tashfell was completely dissatisfied with that concept of people and then he said this doesn't tally with people's social reality and in fact I would guess his real life's mission was to put a more properly social psychology of group membership and identity onto the agenda. So what is social identity theory trying to say? Well it starts with a very simple idea that once a group membership becomes important to you, and it might be important to you everywhere you go in many different situations, or it might be important in just some situations. 
that was the first key idea, that identity is not something necessarily fixed or permanent, but very much depended on the situation confronting you. So if you're at war, it's very important. If you're at war with that country, but then if you're not... Then your then national it identity, especially vis-a-vis -vis some other nations, will be very important. But in another setting, your football team identity would be much more important. Or, as we are now, my professional identity as an academic probably is uppermost in my mind. So people's identities very much determined by the situation they find themselves in. And that's the starting point. So the group that you belong to has an impact on how you see yourself. And again, that was a really novel idea. I mean, it, it's been around in philosophy and social philosophy for many years, but he took that idea and said, when people belong to a group, they incorporate aspects of that group into their self-concept. It becomes the group, in a sense, psychologically becomes part of them and they become part of the group. And so your perceptions, your cognitions, your emotions, what you feel, what you think about the world is very much determined by what you think other people are thinking of your group or are doing to your group. Henri's work, first of all, cared about understanding how social psychological processes operate in social context. And one of the key things about that is what it says to you is if you want to be a good social psychologist, you've got to turn your head towards society. You've got to understand the society you're living in. You can't say, oh, we don't need to know about that. We can just look at the pure social psychological process because that will explain everything. And one of the things that strikes you when you read Henri's books is in a, in a sense, how, how knowledgeable and how cultured he is. If you read his, his 78 book, for instance, you will read about Burundi and Rwanda, and he virtually predicts what would happen in the 90s, years beforehand, because he was aware of social phenomena. It's a picture, I'm afraid, of the most horrible catastrophe that's taking place in Rwanda. The evidence of atrocities, man. If you are a... Hutu, and you believe that your group has systematically suffered at the hands of the Tutsi, this has an impact on your self-esteem. Given the opportunity, given all the other things that Tashvel didn't look at, like, for example, totalitarian leadership, particular economic conditions, and so on, then you will do things, given that opportunity, to favour your group systematically over the other group. The remarkable thing for me about social identity theory is often described in the textbooks as a theory of discrimination. Why do people act negatively towards other groups? But actually, for Henri, the notion that we seek to make our groups positively valued in comparison with other groups is a starting point. To ask, well, that might be true as a psychological process, a psychological motive, but we live in a world where so often people objectively are negatively valued. We live in a racist world, in a sexist world. And the real question for Arbery was how and when do they challenge it? And for him, the group wasn't the source of problems, it was the solution. It was through collective action that we will challenge the inequalities of the world. It puts social change on the agenda. And there are many who've tried to put Targefell's theories into practice. Miles Houston and Rupert Brown have spent their careers looking at whether bringing two groups into contact with each other results in them liking each other any better. And it all comes down to whether you make those initial group memberships salient. So if you're trying to get some English people and some Germans to change their views about each other, should you emphasise their nationality or keep quiet about it? Together with Miles Houston, we had the idea that it was important when you brought groups together to keep some semblance of their identities salient so that if you brought majority and minority groups together you shouldn't try and abolish their group identities make them think they're just individuals or make them think they're all just part of one single group because as social identity theory teaches us it's important for them to maintain their distinctiveness we did some work a few years ago where we tried to change british students negative stereotypes of German students and we had in one condition a rather typical and the other condition a rather atypical German student so we had a Peter in one condition and we had a Fritz or a Wolfgang in the other condition we had one of these people studying Chinese history not fitting with the stereotype of German efficiency and technical dryness and brilliance we had them studying engineering or chemistry so we built up these stereotypes and we found 
much stronger generalization when the German student they encountered was typical rather than atypical. You want to create the positive relations between the people present, but if their group memberships are not salient, then all that will happen is people will change their views about isolated group members, what we call cosmetic change, and they won't change their views about the group as a whole. If you want contact to work, to have generalized impact, changing views as groups as a whole, social categories must be part and parcel of the contact situation. This is interesting considering David Cameron's assertion that multicultural Britain hasn't worked and that a stronger single national identity is what's needed. Today, Tarchfell's theories are still being applied to real-life situations. Currently, Miles Houston is embarking on a large project where British children from different ethnic origins are brought together at school. With the way that Henri Targefell's work was grounded in the real world, I'm tempted to believe he'd have approved of how his theories have been developed and applied. And one of his main legacies lies in what's been termed the Targefell diaspora. Many of the senior positions in social psychology, not only in the UK but elsewhere too, are held by students of Targefell, or students of his students. Michael Billick. I certainly would never even thought of becoming a, an academic had it not been for his encouragement. But he persuaded me to do a PhD and, of course, he inspired me. Not just in the ideas he had, but in the example which he set. He was a fully rounded intellectual. He was intensely curious about ideas and uh, if you said something halfway sensible he would make you think that was the most impressive thing he'd heard all day and then he would go off on a great tangent about how that would lead to this and that idea and so on. He used to take phone calls in the middle of our lectures. This was of course before the era of the mobile phone. So he'd be feet along the corridor and his secretary would knock on the door and she'd say, Professor Tarshaw, we've got Geneva on the line or Paris on the line. We thought this was absolutely fantastic. We loved it. He wasn't always the clearest lecturer, and he wasn't always the best prepared lecturer by today's criteria and the need to have all your handouts together. He would have been appalling, but he made you care. He made you want to go out and find out for yourself. He was the only professor whose nine o'clock lectures we got up for. That's saying something. <laughs> and he used to lecture on Fridays at nine o'clock in the morning. I think if you talked to his colleagues from those days, he probably didn't pull his weight as an academic. He sort of disappeared to the south of France around the time that exams were to be marked and that kind of thing. Some people have used the phrase didn't suffer fools gladly. He used to hold the seminars in his office, which was a huge office. Today it would house about ten people. Huge office in overlooking this beautiful Georgian Square in Bristol. And um, someone whose name I won't mention today was giving a seminar, which at some point he concluded was rather dull. So he started making phone calls from his desk at the back of the room, which I think is pretty much not suffering fools gladly. <laughs> 